This idyllic setting was ground zero for the clash of several worlds. Here, in a most visibly dramatic fashion, the post-Civil War Victorian era met the future. And it all happened over the remodeling of a home. Hello, I'm Jim Wilhelm. This area was once the wealthiest section of Springfield, and it was nicknamed Aristocracy Hill. And it was here that a lady seeking to define her role in upper society made a startling visual statement. Her name was Susan Dana, and she was somewhat shunned from high society because her family's wealth came from new money. Later, after the deaths of both her husband and father, she came into control of the estate and decided to remodel the family home. But she didn't hire a prominent local architect. She hired a man from Chicago. And not a known name either, but a relative newcomer, considered by many people in the field to be a kind of an oddity. His name was Frank Lloyd Wright. At that time, in 1901, Mr. Wright was just starting his career. He had designed several homes, but no public buildings, and had yet to expand his concepts. Susan Dana essentially handed him a blank check to do what he pleased. Imagine this street lined with the finest Victorian homes, homes of geometric symmetry with box-like rooms all butted against one another. In the midst of those moneyed homes, he built this. This is a statement. For Dana, it's a redefinition of a woman's role in society because she not only entertained, but also supported the arts and education, along with working for political and social change. And as for Frank Lloyd Wright's, it's a rejection of popular design. Instead of the vertical, his buildings emphasized the horizontal, emulating the vast prairie. And to create those lines, above and below the outside brick, he had the mortar recessed, which created a shadow line. Above, the roof seems to be raised from the brick wall by rows of ribbon windows and the decorative plaster frieze. The frieze is done in an Art Deco-like motif, but interestingly, it was designed some 20 years before that movement. And all along the exterior are several built-in planters creating a green waterfall of vines, almost as if the organicness of the home is spilling out into the streets. Organic is a good word, since Wright took many of his design cues from nature. Although Frank Lloyd Wright was given pretty much carte blanche, Susan Dana did have her say. In fact, she got some things designed into the house that no other client of Wright ever did. For example, Wright didn't care for front doors. In most of his designs, he would hide them behind walls. But this house was different. This house was designed to entertain. It was designed to be the focal point of Springfield society. As such, it is probably the most prominent front door Wright ever designed. Here, two half pillars seem to support a sunburst pattern of bricks emphasizing the archway. Below, the door is trimmed with a stylized art glass rendition of butterflies. Arriving guests would experience a tunnel-like effect looking through the front door, which nicely frames the tall, slender statue by Richard Bach. In turn, the arch of the main fireplace further back in the house frames the statue. Inside, guests are confronted with several floor levels, which seem disconnected because there is no grand staircase. The stairs are on either side in cave-like alcoves. And the wall treatment is very different from the typical heavily papered Victorian world. The rough textured plaster was first painted in a light pastel color, then covered with a pigmented glaze that was wiped off before completely drying. The result is a two-toned wall with various imperfections again creating an organic feeling. Susan's bedroom was over there. From there, she could come out on this walkway to greet her guests. And since the stairs were on the other side, 
It allowed her guests as she strolled around to admire her evening gown. Walls were eliminated to create space. In Wright's design, rooms flow from one to the other, separated by elevation changes. This is a good example of Wright's use of space. As I leave the main foyer, the ceiling is dropped down so low that it makes a person almost want to stoop as he walks through. That tight area suddenly gives way to this cavernous space, which is the dining room. Here the barrel vaulted ceiling soars 26 feet above the diner's heads. Plus there's a balcony where musicians could play as people filtered in for the meal. This was Wright's first project in which he used great ceiling heights. Up till that time he had never worked with anything so bold or wild. And the ceiling seems to grow out from behind the mural which surrounds the dining area. It was painted by George Nydekin, who created murals in several of Wright's other homes. This one, which depicts plants of the prairie, is the only one of his works in a Wright home that remains untouched. This is the first house in Springfield designed for electricity. Unlike other houses of the day, which used a central fixture to provide illumination, Wright designed a lot of indirect lighting. Plus, the fixtures themselves became a part of the art of the building. In this room, there are four free-hanging chandeliers with butterfly patterns, like those over the main doorway. These patterns are reflected on the mural. Visitors sometimes comment about how dim the lighting is in the house, and it is by today's standards. But in a world lit by candles and kerosene, it was considered and written about as one of the lightest and brightest houses in Springfield. The Dana Thomas House is the best preserved and most complete of any of Wright's early prairie homes. More than 100 pieces of his original white oak furniture are still in place, along with 250 art glass windows, doors and panels, and 200 light fixtures. That's due in large part to the fact that the home has only had three owners. After Susan Dana, the home was purchased by the Thomas Publishing Company for offices. But they were also Wright fans, and they kept the home intact. Later, the state bought the property, and in an effort spearheaded by then-Governor Jim Thompson, began a three-year, $5 million restoration project. During that time, great pains were taken to rediscover Wright's original color schemes and bring the home back to when Susan Dana first walked inside. This home has 35 rooms on three main levels, but it has 16 varying levels. The most dramatic space is reached at the end of a long corridor with built-in planters. At the end, guests take a few steps up to a landing make a U-turn and then pass through a low ceiling. They entered this bright and large entertainment area called the gallery, and it has one of only three barrel vaulted ceilings that Wright ever designed. Two are in this building, one is in his own home in Oak Park. The walls in this room are ribbon windows, letting in both the outside and lots of natural light. At the front end, below a musician's balcony, is this stage area. Here Susan would host lectures, recitals, poetry readings, and church services. Behind the fireplace is a small prep kitchen where the desserts and coffee are prepared. And these tables have a dual purpose. They can be folded up in the middle to create a display easel for paintings or prints, or they can be folded up completely in order to be moved. Today the building is open for public guided tours, and for special occasions the yard and gallery can be rented in the evening. So once again this home has become what Susan Dana intended it to be, a place to entertain and enlighten. This building was Wright's first opportunity to bring together all of his concepts, and it helped him secure other commissions. 
The best description we've heard of this building is to say that living here would be like living inside a work of art. For information about when the home is open, call 217-782-6776 or log on to their website at www.dana-thomas.org.